Well, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Common Practice. My name is Matt Rustin. I'm the executive director at Made to Flourish and Common Practice webinar. This is our weekly check-in, um, regular check-in as a Made to Flourish network, talking about the ways that we can be leading and shepherding uh, the church in these really uncertain and challenging times. So we get started this week. Our webinar is uh, graciously sponsored by Thrivent. Uh, we're thankful for Thrivent's mission, which seeks to help people make the most of what they're given. And you can learn more about their work at Thrivent.com. They're really doing uh, fantastic work. Well, our discussion today is diagnosing the disconnect, why people aren't connecting faith and work. There's this thing that happens uh, to me sometimes. I'm not sure if this ever happens to you, but I'm talking to someone about a subject, uh, maybe something I'm really passionate about or feel deeply about, and I think I'm making a really good point or that I'm being really, really clear, just crystal clear. And the other person seems to be nodding along. They're, they're tracking with me, uh, or at least I think. But then later I find out uh, that they weren't tracking with me at all, that I must not have been clear. We weren't communicating. Uh, whatever I was saying, the message wasn't landing, at least not like I thought it was. Uh, wondering if that's ever happened to you, maybe with a friend or with a spouse uh, or with a child or, or with your congregation, maybe. <laughs> New research suggests that at least in one important area, pastors are talking, uh, but the message is not landing, at least not the way that pastors think it is. It's when pastors talk about helping people connect their faith in Jesus with their everyday work. New research by uh, Denise Daniels and Elaine Eklund suggests that pastors think they're talking about connecting faith in Christ with everyday work quite a bit, quite a lot. But when that same question is asked of their congregations, uh, they say that their pastor doesn't really talk about work much at all. Maybe that's why in part uh, in that same research project, uh, it revealed that 78% of congregants reported that they would not feel comfortable or had, it had never occurred to them to talk to their pastor about issues of work. 78% of people in churches. Let's do just a little bit of math there. Um, so if you're a church of 200 people, that means 160 of the congregation is not comfortable or would never even think of talking to their pastor about work. Okay, one more. If you're a church of 1,500, maybe you're a bigger church, 1,200 of the people think that work is off limits to talk to their, to their pastor about. Now, maybe that seems like a trivial point. Uh, who cares, right? But think about the world that we're living in right now, all the upheaval that people are experiencing in their workplace around COVID, around unemployment, uncertainty, the racial tensions, and what is, what is coming and let's just make it concrete with just one issue, like uh, let's say stress and one work environment, uh, schools. Let's, let's think about what's happened with, with that in the last five months. Uh, teachers went from 100% of their time with students was face-to-face, -face, was in the same room, was uh, dealing with the subtleties of facial expressions and emotions and, and is that child learning, to going to a place where 100% is online and this is a whole new world. It's almost like a different job uh, that they were doing. You think about the principals and the superintendents who are trying to figure out what this next school year is going to be. Do they open? Do they not open? Are they wearing, wearing masks? Are they not wearing masks? What do we do with students? Uh, what do we do with all the surfaces, all the tension uh, that parents are experiencing, all the tension and, and pressure from governments? Schools are a place where there's a ton of stress. And now what if what if 78% of the educators in your church feel like that is completely off limits to talk to their pastor about? They would never even think about it. I think that's a tragedy. I think most of us would say that's a, that's a tragedy. So why is there such a massive disconnect and what is the church supposed to do about it? Well, I'm so glad that we're having today's conversation with two really excellent panelists. Uh, the first panelist that we're going to be talking with is Dr. Denise Daniels. Uh, Denise is the newly appointed Hudson T. Harrison Endowed Chair of Entrepreneurship at Wheaton College. And uh, formerly, Denise was a professor of management at Seattle Pacific University. Uh, she's now in her fourth year of a $1.5 million grant from the Lilly Foundation to study faith in the workplace. Denise, it's such a delight to have you join us uh, for this webinar today as we sort out these issues. 
Could you tell us just a little bit about the research project that you've been engaged in? Thanks, Matt. It's, it's great to be here. Um, the project that I'm involved with is with my colleague Elaine Eckland at Rice University. And we've been working for three years now on trying to understand how people in the workplace think about their faith in the context of work. Um, so we, it's a three-phased project. So we started with focus groups in a number of cities around the United States. Then we did a, a 13,000 plus uh, survey of representative sample of folks in the US. And then we followed that up with interviews with almost 200 um, individuals. We talked to them for an hour to an hour and a half, um, getting more in-depth information from each of them about how they thought about faith in the context of work. So we have a lot of data and we're just now in the process of starting to disseminate it. We've gotten one piece published and we're, we've got several more in the works at this point. Um, but it, it's a big study and there's a lot of data and we're, <laughs> and we're trying to get our hands around some of these exact same questions that you're asking. That's great. Well, excited to dive into some of that data in just a few minutes here. So thanks, thanks for that. Our second panelist is Dr. Mark Roberts, and he serves as the executive director at Fuller's Dupree Center for Leadership. Uh, he's got a PhD in New Testament from Harvard. Uh, he's authored numerous books and, and commentaries, and he also writes a really fantastic daily devotional uh, that I would recommend to, to everyone on this call today uh, called Life for Leaders. And you can find that on the Fuller Dupree Center uh, website, Life for Leaders, really fantastic. He's, the, he's also the lead professor uh, for Fuller's Doctor of Ministry cohort in Faith, Work, Economics, and Vocation, where he's equipping pastors in the United States and really around the world on how they can be helping equip their, their congregations to connect uh, faith and work. So uh, he himself has been a pastor. He's a professor leading other pastors. Mark, tell us just a little bit about uh, your work with uh, the Dupree Center, and we're just delighted that you're joining us today. Well, thanks, Matt. Good to be with you, and always good to team up with you and Denise. Uh, so the Dupree Center is a part of Fuller Seminary, but we are largely sort of outward facing. So we're not so much dealing with students as we are with folks in the marketplace and with the pastors who serve fo folks in the marketplace. So uh, our calling and our mission is to Sort of take the the theology and the scripture and all that we would do in a seminary and try to make it uh, relevant to the lives of everyday folk especially in their work and then we try also to help pastors and churches do a better job serving those people excellent excited to have more conversation with you uh, mark and thanks for joining us as we get started we're going to start with a poll that should uh, populate on your screen and we want to get just a feedback understand who our audience is and some of the things that are going on so um that should uh, pop up. And uh, here are the two questions. Take just a moment, answer these. How often do you engage with congregants if you're a pastor or uh, if you attend a church with your pastor about workplace issues? Often, sometimes when it happens to come up, rarely I can't remember the last time that I had a conversation with a congregant or a pastor or uh, it never comes up. Then the second question, has COVID-19 and issues of race and all that's going on in our world produced any conversations about faith in the workplace uh, more often than before, about the same as before, or less often uh, than before? So take just a moment and fill those out. See a number of you are weighing in uh, right now. Uh, 65, almost 70% of you have voted. And as those poll results are coming in, I'm gonna end the poll here in about uh, three seconds. So get those final answers in. Okay, we're gonna end this poll and share the results. Uh, so here's what you said. 36% of you said that you have these conversations either with your pastor or if you are a pastor with your congregants, quite a bit, comes up often in a regular basis. Um, most of you said 42% uh, sometimes. It's not a lot, but it comes up from time to time. That's still encouraging. 17%, almost one in five said rarely. Uh, on that second question, it seems like what's going on now with COVID and race and all the issues that people are facing, 58% uh, of you are having more conversations than you typically would. Uh, that's encouraging. Uh, 36 is about the same as before. So thank you for uh, weighing in on that poll. That kind of gives us a little bit of feel for at least um, those of you who are tuning in uh, are experiencing these conversations in, in your local church. Well, the primary way that you can interact with us during this uh, webinar session is through the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, so you should see that little button. If you wanna ask a question, anything that comes up at any point, make a comment, make a question, a story of, of how you're experiencing this, 
these issues in your place, uh, feel free to type those in. In about the second half of the call, we'll get to those questions and comments. So we do want to hear from you. That's uh, what, what this webinar is designed for. All right, we're going to get started now and want to start with you, Denise. Uh, you mentioned this survey, really an impressive set of data. 13,000 people were sent a survey. Um, you followed up with more than 150 interviews uh, personally with people uh, about what they felt like they needed from their pastor and from their church to help them connect uh, their faith in their work and what was top of mind. What did you hear and what did you learn from uh, the results of that study? Sorry about that. I forgot to unmute myself. A um, couple of, of different things that emerged. First of all, we have the survey data and then we have the qualitative data from the interviews. And I'm going to start with the qualitative for a second, um, although we can go back to some of that quantitative from the survey too, if you want. Um, when we were talking to people, we, we asked them questions and then we started to group their responses into categories. And what we found was that there were three kinds of, of things that emerged, three categories of things that emerged that people said that they really wanted from their churches or from their pastors. Um, the first category was encouragement and support for their work. Um, there was a sense on the part of the people that we talked to that their pastors just weren't talking about work very much. And again, it's interesting because when we talk to pastors, that's not the sense we get. So there is a disconnect. There is a, a little bit of a feeling that pastors think they're talking about it. Congregants aren't hearing it. Um, what congregants, congregants said that they wanted was some sense of an affirmation of the spiritual value of the meaning of their work or the, the purpose of their work. Um, I'm going to pull up here a quick quote. Um, this was from an evangelical woman. She worked in social media and she says, I feel like my job now, I'd love for it to be more maybe spiritually meaningful, but I don't exactly know how to get there. So you hear in that sentence, this kind of plaintive sense of wanting to feel like her work has meaning for the kingdom of God, but not getting it, not knowing how to make that connection for herself. Um, another woman, this was a woman in, in a mainline church, and she said to us, she says, tell faith leaders to discuss faith in the workplace openly and intentionally. So again, some sense that it's not coming up as directly as people might want it to come up. So they wanted this encouragement, they wanted this support, they wanted this sense of affirmation and meaning. And also in this category were people who said, you know, we really have struggles at work and we want our pastors, our churches to be supportive when we're going through times of job loss, when we are looking for jobs, when we're in a challenging profession, when we have a lot of demands that our job is requiring, we want our church to be more supportive of that. So encouragement and support for work was category one. Um, the second category that we heard from people pretty consistently was some sense of they wanted from their church communities guidance and direction about how they should be engaging with their faith at work. And what was interesting in this category was that there was a little bit of a difference between people depending on age. So younger people, people who are in their 20s and 30s, they wanted guidance about how to navigate a pluralistic workforce as a Christian. Um, they wanted to know how to engage appropriately with people of different religions and what that looks like. What, what is an ideal kind of Christian engagement in a pluralistic workforce? People who are older, and here I'm looking at people who are 50 plus, they tended to ask questions or want their churches to be supporting them in understanding how they could appropriately talk about their faith at work. So they were much more oriented to being intentional about sharing faith and wanted to know how to do that appropriately. They wanted to know what was in bounds, so to speak. Um, and they wanted guidance from their pastors on how to do that in the workplace. So guidance about how to engage faith at work was the second category. And then the third category of responses that we heard from these folks were they, they wanted more support at church. So literally in the church context, they wanted more support. And these were really practical things, things like they wanted flexible offerings of worship services. If, if they had to work on Sunday, they wanted to be able to worship in a church context on another, on another day. Um, small group opportunities. We heard this from women, particularly, they wanted to have opportunities for engaging with other people, not during the workday, because many of them were working. Um, they wanted a sense of more hospitality extended towards them at church. They wanted a sense that they weren't looked down on for the kind of work that they did. They, they mentioned things like disparaging remarks uh, related to a given career path that they may have heard. Um, they wanted examples of people like them that were talked about 
positively in the church um, context, whether that was sermons or, or otherwise, and particularly examples of women at, in the workplace, in sermon illustrations, that kind of thing. So encouragement and support for their work, guidance for how to engage their faith at work, and support for them in the church context were kind of the three categories of things that we heard from them. Yeah, that's fascinating um, stuff. Uh, appreciate you sharing that, Denise. And you know, as you think about those three those three uh, sets, um, a number of things stuck out to me. That second category of people wanting support uh, in how to engage faith and work issues, but it being a little bit different depending on what the demographic was. What do you make of that? Um, is it that people who are younger are more aware of differences and are more sensitive to that? Is it that older people feel like they have maybe more uh, agency and, and ability to, to be expressive and, and to talk about their faith? Or what, what do you make of that? Those are, those are great questions. I think it's a couple things. I think part of it is that younger people have been um, socialized in a more pluralistic context. So many of them have come through school with more diverse people. We just are, we are as a as a population in the United States, we are more diverse in younger groups than we are in older groups. And so younger people are used to diversity in ways that maybe older people have not been historically used to. And they're trying to figure out how do I live out my faith in this very pluralistic context, in a context in which Christianity is not assumed to be the, the or the primary or the ideal kind of, of religious orientation. Um, what does it mean to be a Christian in that context? And what does it mean at work to, for, for me to live that out appropriately. So I think that's what's happening a little bit with the younger folks. With the older folks, I think your comment about agency is a really good one. Um, I do think there is more of a sense of agency with older people because they are typically higher in an organizational setting. They have that they're up in the higher in the organizational hierarchy, 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 boy, <laughs> um, typically. And um, so, so there is more of a sense of agency. There is more of a sense too, I think, and, and this is, is perhaps based on their own socialization experience, that the point of the Christian faith is to share it. And so they're coming to this question about faith in the workplace in terms of how do I share my faith at work? The younger folks aren't asking that question as much. They're wanting more to know, how do I live out my faith? How do I be a Christian? And older people are wanting to know more about how do I share this faith? How do I give it away? recognizing that not everyone is a Christian, but how do I do that appropriately? And I think there's also a fear on the part of some older folks. And I'm, when I say older, I'm including myself in this category now. <laughs> I've just crossed the 50 threshold. And so <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm now in that older category. But um, th these are people who are thinking through questions of what's, what's in bounds. They recognize that culture is changing and it's changing around them and, and what they used to be comfortable in is no longer the setting that they find themselves in and they don't know what the rules are. And so they're desperately wanting from their church communities to figure out what's okay for me to say, what's okay for me to, to talk about and are there things that I shouldn't be saying or shouldn't be sharing. Um, so I think there's some fear that, that drives. It seems them. like it's not just like what's technically in bounds by the law or appropriate, but like what is a wise way to engage publicly in yeah, what, that would be how do, how do I do this in a way that's thoughtful? Kind of been, yeah, what's winsome, what's thoughtful? Um, how do I do it appropriately in a way that's going to be heard positively? So, so these are um, these are questions about sharing faith, but recognizing again that we live in a pluralistic context. Hmm, that's really good. And it just reminds me that it's it's probably not enough to say you ought to be public about your faith. You ought to be sharing your faith in the workplace. It's the, the more important question is how do we actually do that well? Mm -hmm. And uh, excited to come back to you in just a few moments. I wanna go to Mark now. And Mark, you know, you've, you've served as a pastor um, uh, in a few different places. You've also been a professor and, and you're helping uh, students engage, pastors engage with how to deal with these issues. Maybe speak first of all uh, in your pastoral role as you as you think back how did you approach some of these issues that that denise is um, bringing up how did you experience them how did you learn along the way as a pastor in your pastoral roles man great great question so you know what one thought it's not exactly answering what you said but it, it, it i think it'll tie in is that as i as i listen to denise and i'm aware of her research i, I have such different reactions so part of me is like thinking this, I mean, nobody's ever really done this. This is really amazing. This is really helpful. 
to, to me and my work, to pastors and their work, congregate. I mean, this is, this is gold. That, so that's number one. Then number two, I put myself in the pastor place and I feel defensive, right? It's like, oh, wait a minute. They can't say that I didn't talk enough about faith and work. I did. So there's a lot of me that wants to immediately defend me, defend my church. And, and that's a natural response to new information. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge that because I, I, I can imagine others feeling that way. I think what we need to do, of course, is just acknowledge that and say it, but then say, okay, so not only with myself and my engagement with the research, but uh, Lord willing, with some others, brothers and sisters in Christ, maybe my staff or some fellow pastors, and then ultimately with the Lord, really take this to heart and say, well, okay, Lord, what do you really have for me here? You know, what do I need to hear here? And, and, and let that be an opportunity for discernment and discovery beyond the defensiveness, even though I fully <laughs> acknowledge the defensiveness. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's just one thing I want to say, because I think this I think this research is super important. I mean, this is this is gold for pastors and for churches. This is really getting inside of things that are sometimes hard to get inside of. So that's number one. And just let me say that. The thing that strikes me again and again is that uh, on the one hand, there are lots of expectations for pastors. Uh, and I think many need to be taken seriously and are fair. But I'm also aware that even without a pandemic, most pastors feel like I, I've already got more than I can possibly handle. I, I, I mean, how, now I got to do this. And I think that I, I completely understand that. And I have a couple of thoughts about it. So one is, although in some ways we're, we're talking, what, what do pastors need to learn? Pastors need to learn. I really think in a more adaptive leadership sense, this is about what churches need to learn and become. I mean, there's no way the pastor can sort through all these different issues of what it's gonna be for people's lives and come up on Sunday morning with all the answers. That's impossible. This has to be a function of the body of Christ as a community learning to work together on these things. And the pastor isn't then the source of all answers but rather the one who helps the body of Christ to function well. So that's, that's one thought. The, the second thought, and, and you know, Matt, for you folks in, in Made to Flourish, this is going to be s s things you say all the time. But again and again and again, as I listen to Denise, I think there is no way a pastor is going to be able to do this stuff without getting to know his or her people well in their workplace. Because I was thinking my own pastoral experience. When did I talk to people about their work? Hmm. Mostly when I visited them at work. Because <laughs> then it was completely natural to say, you know, so what do you do? And how do you do it? And what are your challenges? And it, it, if I'm sort of far away from that, even if I love my people, even if sometimes I talk about work and sermons, I, I'm just not going to be engaging with them in their world and their questions. And so when I think about what helped me as a pastor, and again, this is like made to flourish gospel, right? You, you, but this is so important. It's just getting to know their pe your people, but in the context of their work. Now, these days, that's not going to be a visit most of the time. That's going to be using various kinds of technologies to, to really engage with people in the context of their work, workplace, which is mostly this reality, right? That's really great, Mark. I, you know, as you're as you're talking, um, you know, you were learning these things as a pastor and and meeting with people sort of on their turf. And now, of course, it's hard to do that uh, physically, but uh, there are opportunities to do that online and in other ways. As you as you began to do that as a pastor, uh, were there any light bulbs that came on? Was there a story that comes to mind of something that like totally reframed your perspective? as a pastor in the way that a congregant was maybe living out their faith and work in a way that yeah. you had never even thought of before or um, yeah. What comes to mind on that? Yeah. So, so two quick stories. One was I went to visit somebody who was an editor of a, of a newspaper and, and I knew his work was busy and he would talk about that. But I remember we, when we went to lunch, this was before email. Okay. It was a long time ago, but it works in email and text and all that. We, I noticed on his phone that there was one of these red numbers that said how many uh, calls he had. It was like three call, three uh, you know uh, messages, and I. So we go to lunch. We come back in an hour, and now it says fifty six. And I said, "Did you get like fifty three messages?" Oh yeah, all the time. That's the nature of my life. 
And that was like, oh my gosh, this guy is living in craziness. And I just wouldn't have known that if I hadn't have been in his office looking at his, at his phone. So that's one story. Second story is, and, and Matt, you know, you know this because you and I have talked about this, but one of the things I sort of happened into as a pastor is what I call the pastor study. And every Thursday morning, I'd get together with people from my congregation, about 20, 25 people, and we would study the text that I was going to preach on on Sunday. Now, they didn't get some polished presentation. It's more like we would walk through it, and then we talk about it. And, and I would say, like, what does this stir up for you? And from that group, what would I hear? I mean, they were getting on, getting ready to go to work. <laughs> you know, again and again and again, I'd hear workplace connections. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. For one thing, now I got a great illustration for this sermon. <laughs> but more importantly, I'm going to connect into what these people are really dealing with. It's their question or sometimes their answers, you know, their insights. And, and, and I'd say, well, can I share that with a congregation? So again, that wasn't the visiting in the workplace. That's actually, you know, at church, but it was a, a place where I as a pastor could listen and learn and engage with people as they engage the text and, and making those connections to work. It's really a beautiful story because sometimes as pastors, we think uh, we know how to apply and, you know, pastors have a lot of wisdom and they think deeply on how to apply texts of scriptures. But, you know, sometimes as a pastor, when we read the Sermon on the Mount and our congregations read the Sermon on the Mount, there are different points of direct application that they're thinking of sort of top of mind. And you got a window into that as you are interacting with the text with with these congregants on Thursday mornings. It's really uh, a fantastic story. I uh, really like that. I want to go back to uh, Denise, and we're going to get to questions just in, in just a moment. So if, if this is stirring anything in you, a, a question, a comment, type that in the Q&A, and we're going to get to those in, in, in just a second. Uh, first of all, just a clarification, uh, Denise. We, we did have a question that came in of, is this research available? Is it online? Is it anywhere that can be accessed? Um, so what, what I just talked about, the three categories, we actually have a paper under review right now that covers the, those topics. And so as a result, that's not accessible in the moment because it's going through a peer review process, but it will be accessible, we hope, very soon when it gets accepted for publication. And we're trying to get some of this work published in open access form because we recognize that you know, not all of you would have access to academic libraries where these journals might otherwise be published. And so we're, we're focusing some of this uh, publications on open access so that pastors can access them. And I'm very, there, there is another piece that has been published that is kind of an overview of this study, which might also be interesting. And I will provide that link to the Made to Flourish folks so they can send it out to um, those of you on the webinar. So there is something that you can access now. There will be more in the future and we are doing our best to make it as accessible as possible. Great, just wanted to clear that up. Thanks, Denise. I wanna go back to the first point that you made on support supporting people uh, with their work. Mm -hmm. One of the findings in your research uh, that you alluded to was sometimes as pastors, we want to sort of paint the existential meaning of work and how noble it can be. And God, you know, God's a worker, it's rooted in creation. But one of the things that you mentioned in your research is that a lot of people just need resources for the struggle that is going on in their work. Maybe they're feeling unstable or that they're going to be unemployed soon or that they're just super or they get 53 calls at lunchtime, like Mark said, or you think about, you know, the racial injustices and how people feel so beaten down. Can you speak to how your research illuminates the need not to just speak to the high minded glory of, of faith and work, but also the real fallenness of the world that we live in and how pastors can speak to that? It's interesting because that's most of what we heard. People who were talking about their particular situation and wanting a sense of how is this meaningful? What do I do? How do I, how do I understand my faith in the context of this particular thing? And you know, to Mark's point, pastors can't be experts in every career option. Um, so I, I don't think it's reasonable to expect for a pastor to come and say, "Oh, well, this is what you do. This is the meaning that you can you can take from it." I don't I don't think that's it. Um, but there have to be ways for people to make it real. Um, and we did hear from a number of people things along the lines of what Mark was saying, which was, I don't think my pastor gets how totally stressed I am, how totally busy I feel. And somebody made the comment, you know, I know pastors are busy too, but their work is more flexible in time. At least that was the perception. And um, 
they, they didn't feel like their pastor really understood the time bound nature of their own demands and how little flexibility they had in their particular job and how, how much stress that created on their, their life and their family and everything else. So I think, again, trying to get a better sense of what are the demands, what are the stress points, um, not necessarily becoming an expert in every industry and every career, because again, unreasonable, but what are the general themes and then how can we help maybe the, the congregation itself develop ways to encourage and understand each other in those, in those ways? Yeah, love that, Denise. We're going to take some time now and pivot and move to some questions that are coming in. And again, this is your chance to write in questions if you're listening, what has been sparking in your mind, and, and we want to get to as many of those as possible. I want to go to Mark with the first question that came in from Seth. Um, he says, how do pastors effectively help people with faith in the workplace when they cannot or should not focus their preaching on it too much? And so I hear from Seth a question like, you know, there's a million things that we need to bring up in the sermon. Right. We need to talk about justice. We need to talk about race. Right. We need to talk about, you know, there's so many things. So I want you to, I want you to do something. I want you to make a case for the importance in preaching, but then also to a ask, uh, answer Seth's question of, yeah. yeah, you know, how do we balance that? You know, that is a great question. And as one who preached in, in the same church for 16 years, I totally get that because there's all these things and you feel so overwhelmed. I mean, minimally, it's important that work go on the list of the main things we're going to talk about fairly regularly. You know, I think we all have that list in our head, sort of, you know, prayer and evangelism and family. And, you know, you have your list, just whatever it is that work belongs there. That's number one. Number two, I think pastors need to remember that most of our people, especially if you understand work more broadly and not just paid work. I mean, most of our people are working. This is what they do with all of their life. So it's not exactly a small segment of life, you know, this is a huge piece of their lives. This is where they live. And we really want to speak to people where they live. So I think that makes the case for not only putting work on the list of the things I mentioned fairly often, but maybe even promoting it up the list quite a ways, because this is where our people are and where they're living their faith and where they're growing. Third thing I would say, and this is a commercial, but it isn't just that pastors have to talk about work and give people good theology and good practice and good ethics. We are also in the business of helping people to be formed in Christ, right? To, to grow in their faith, to know the Lord. And the more we can help people do that in, in the context of work, the better off we are. Now, I say this is commercial because two of my favorite resources in the world do this. And one is a book that Denise helped to co-write. Her book with a, with a colleague, Working in the Presence of God's Spiritual Practices for Everyday Work. This book isn't about, here's all the answers to all your questions. This is how you can be formed in Christ in the context of your work, gaining wisdom and, and knowing God's presence and guidance more deeply. And, and, and so that's going to equip you for all kinds of stuff, not with the answers, but with your own formation. And, and the other resource, and you'd mentioned it earlier, but the, the Life for Leaders devotion that I write is, you know, it's every day, it's scripture, how does this connect into our lives and work? And again, the purpose isn't just to give people all the answers. The purpose is to help us be formed so that we can be the kind of people who can then deal with the tough challenges that come our way. So, the more, so it, it's not just pastors talking about work, it's pastors helping their people be formed in Christ for their work and through their work. Yeah, I love that. Um, I want to go uh, to Denise now and, and follow up with something that, that Mark just alluded to. Um, there's a couple questions that have come in that have um, kind of addressed this. I, I got a question from Al here. He said, how do you bridge the spiritual gap since work and faith seem very ordinary? They don't seem very spiritual. You know, I'm, I'm doing 50 social media posts today, or I'm, you know, a realtor and I'm trying to get an inspection done and negotiate between these two parties. That doesn't feel very spiritual, uh, you know, kind of in air quotes, right? Um, your book sort of sought to address that around spiritual practices in some ways of bringing uh, this life with God into the ordinary areas of work. How does that question from Al strike you? What, what yeah. comes to mind? 
Yeah, you know, um, Shannon Vanderwerker and I were co-authors on this book, and um, it's, as, as several people have mentioned, working in the presence of God. And there's an allusion there to Brother Lawrence, um, and we, we were really drawn to his notion of, you know, being in the kitchen and peeling potatoes and doing it for God's glory. Um, and recognizing that God has you in these mundane roles often. <laughs> um, even if you have a great job that you love that feels very meaningful, much of the time it's mundane. Much of the time it's gonna be tedious because you're doing things that are just kind of routine and don't necessarily feel real spiritual. And so what are things that you can do in the context of your everyday that can help you recognize God's presence, that can help you recognize that God is shaping you and that God endeavors to shape the world around you for God's purposes. Um, and, and so these were spiritual disciplines that we effectively said, we can engage these in the context of the everyday. This doesn't have to just be at home during quiet time before everyone gets up. This can be as you're commuting to your work. This can be as you're opening up your outlook and looking through your calendar for the day. There are ways that you can attend to what God is doing and ways that you can start thinking about your work in a different way. And so it's a reframe. It's a reframe about how you conceive of your work and your workplace in the context of what God is doing um, and trying to join in in God's work in your workplace. That's interesting, Denise. Um, you, you mentioned just the one example of opening up your email. And, you know, I spend my time thinking about connecting faith and work and spirituality but when I open up my email and see 76, you know, unread messages, the last thing I'm thinking about is like God and how like he, the life with him comes to bear on that. So like, how do we even begin to take a step in that direction? Is it, is it we just say one simple thing or do you kind of leave it vague for vague for, for congregants or like, how do you actually help people do this? Um, I, mean, I, think I guess I'm a, confessing that I don't think about my email in that way. And, and well, I guess I would, say, I would say, I'd say two things to you, Matt. I would say, um, and, and, and let me preface all of this with, I am a pilgrim on this journey. So I do not have all the answers. I am not an expert. I am really still learning this. Um, but two things. Number one is I think that um, when you have that sense of anxiety, when you open up that email, and in my case, it was, you know, one three hour period where I got 400 emails. And I'm like, I can't, you know, there's just this, sort of panic, right? <laughs> when that feeling emerges, that's the cue of, oh, this is something I've got to, I've got to step back. I can't do this on my own. And so that's the, the, the prompt to turn your attention to God is when you get that moment of feeling, I don't know how to, I don't know how to manage them. I'm overwhelmed. Um, that's the prompt. The second thing I would say is that there's no magic answer. There's no kind of formula for, well, if you just say these three words, then everything will be fine. <laughs> um, so different people are going to approach it different ways. And, and God uses different techniques and different strategies with different people. So that might be as simple as saying, God, help me focus on what's most important in this moment, in this particular 30 second period of time, help me attend to what you want me to attend to. Maybe that's, maybe that's what it is in that moment. But it might also be on a more ongoing basis, um, Lord, help me to see this person in the way that you see them as I'm walking into a meeting, as I'm thinking through what all my um, agenda items are for the day and I'm thinking through who I'm gonna be interacting with. Lord, help me focus my attention to what you want to be focused on. Um, help me to see the person in front of me and not necessarily just the task, um, those kinds of things. I love that. It's such a beautiful picture, too, of what our world needs. You read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, your local newspaper, and so much of the hurt in our world, the pain that people are experiencing is the in the context of workplaces. Mm -hmm. You think about the Me Too movement, you think about all these race issues, you think about um, people getting fired, losing their job, and, and don't we kind of wouldn't it be awesome if the people of God were the type of people that go into a hard meeting saying, God, your presence, your peace, your, may I honor this person with the dignity that you have endowed them with. And, you know, it seems to me like that's a beautiful picture of God's people scattered in a million places uh, throughout the work week. And, and just to say, and, and so it opens up new ways that pastors can help their people with work. So it isn't just the important piece of helping people have a good theology of work. We need to do that. 
of making applications that really connect. We need to do that. But this is a whole area of spiritual formation, development, discipleship, whatever your language, that we can, that is super important because it's really empowering our people and it can change their experience of work. I'll just share a, 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 my own response to uh, Denise's book, Denise and Shannon's book. I mean, the thing that really grabbed me, they have a chapter on surrendering your calendar. Now, I sort of have used to surrender my calendar each day, but they're very clear. No, in the morning, take your calendar and kind of walk through it and talk with God about your calendar. And so I've literally started doing that since I've read their book. In fact, if you look at my to-do list, it says surrendering your calendar. That's the topic. And I go through that and pray through my day. Now, number one, that's actually really changed my experience of my work. And that's been a real gift. But again, if I were pastoring a congregation, see, I could... I could help people learn to do that. And that's going to be relevant to whatever workplace people are in, whatever they're doing, whatever challenge. And again, so it opens up a whole new sort of horizon of things that pastors can attend to and help folks with. And, and it's, it's really, I think it's really awesome. What I love about that example, Mark, is that sometimes as pastors, as spiritual leaders, uh, we think about helping to help those people out there integrate faith with work. But it strikes me that as oftentimes as pastors, yeah we haven't been fully integrating our faith with our work, like to think through looking at your schedule, which, you know, that makes many of our blood pressures rise and it just seems overdone. And like, that's the first point of application for connecting faith to work is surrendering our, and no matter who you are, whether you're a, a church leader or whether you're working on wall street, like that's, that's a really tangible thing. I love that example uh, that you give. Um, I want to go to um, Denise. Um, there's a comment from, James here. And James asks, ha, have you or has anyone done any research around the stressors that pastors face in their work versus the stressors that a congregation faces? Mm -hmm. um, assuming that there are similarities, how might these similarities help pastors relate and communicate to their congregation? Or if there are differences in the unique stressors in those areas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. And um, as far as I'm aware, there's not great research on this particular topic. Um, one of the things that we are doing with the research project that we're involved with is we are interviewing pastors. So we've done, um, I mentioned we've done about 160 interviews with Christian, practicing Christians in the workplace. We've done about 30 more with uh, pastors. And we've also done some interviews with both uh, Jewish and Muslim respondents as well, but that's for a different that's for a different time. In our interviews with pastors, um, we, we do have the sense that pastors have a lot of demands on their time, a lot of demands on their schedule, a lot of demands on their lives. And, um, and it's impossible to be all things to all people. So that does come through really clearly. In terms of how do you use that or how could that be used to make connections with congregants? Um, I was thinking about there was a, one of our congregants made the comment, I know pastors are stressed. I know pastors are busy too, but and, and sort of in that, but they sort of undermine that whole thing um, of acknowledging and recognizing the pastor role and then move on to talk about, but my stress is worse is kind of the, the implication there. Um, I don't know that I have an answer for that. I don't know that I've got great data to bring to bear. Um, we are starting to get some of that data about pastors and it would be really interesting to start to see and make the, those kind of side-by-side -side comparisons to, to make those connections. One of the things I, I do think is that pastoring job is a job. And so just like anybody in the congregation who's working, the pastor is working. And so from your own experience, if you're a pastor, drawing on that to um, kind of connect with congregants might be a useful thing, but we don't have enough data for me to give a, a lot of helpful guidance for you on that. Yeah, that's, I love that, Denise, because you think about just the, what is the job of pastoring and you're, you're scheduling meetings and you're um, leading initiatives and you're uh, trying to plan down the road and and many of those things do cross over um, so that's that's a really good point point. and I also would one, one other thing I guess I would say is I think pastors sometimes come to the table feeling a little bit under um, under resourced or like like I don't really ha I haven't been in corporate America I don't know what that's like um, but on the other hand they do have exactly what you've said Matt which is experience with meetings and you know, public speaking and one-on-ones and managing a staff and oftentimes and managing a budget, all of those things are, can be applicable to lots of different contexts. And so maybe recognizing that what they do is not 
so different in some ways than what their congregants are doing, at least at, at a very global level. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, I want to send this question to Mark. A question comes in from Stephen, and he says, we so often reduce faith and work discussions to personal formation or means to a better end. And I think that's obviously really important because uh, sometimes we don't make those connections. But how do pastors also help their congregants begin to explore the intrinsic beauty and goodness of their specific type of work? So I'm going to uh, interact with that a little bit, Mark, and kind of not just a big, broad work is important in God's story, but, you know, I'm a... Um, I'm a manager at a retail. I, I work at Burger King. Um, I, I'm a chemist. I, I'm a realtor. I'm a, I'm a manager. Like, how do we drill down to the intrinsic beauty of, of work that we might not see as beautiful or significant? Yeah, I, I love that question. And because it, it, uh, it's easy to think for many workers that their work just isn't a part of that, right? That, that, that they're not a part of adding beauty uh, to quote Sarah Groves or, or you know, they're, they're, and so, but I won't keep rambling on saying that's a good question. Uh, I have two, two examples. So one is an example of a, a, a man who owns several car dealerships and, you know, in one sense, the purpose of his business is to have a thriving business, to be profitable, to sell good cars and service people and all that. But he has thought through what it means to do that in a way that is not only profitable, but honoring to God and honoring to people and has made so many decisions day after day that are, are beautiful in the sense that they are deeply moral and they are God honoring uh, and even the, the, the design of the places. So you can build an ugly building and sell cars from it, or you can build something that contributes to the community. Uh, you know, when I was in Texas, I was connected with HEB, a grocery company. And, and one of their big things is they build buildings. They want to improve the, the, the look and the feel of the community in which they put their building. So there, there is literally opportunities in some cases to contribute to beauty. But these are if you have a, a quite a bit of authority in a given place. What if you're not that? And I, I think of a, a woman named Michelle with whom I worked when I was in Texas at Lady Lodge, which was a retreat center. And Michelle was one of our housekeepers. And so her work was to go in and clean rooms, <clears throat> including cleaning bathrooms. And she did a phenomenal job. So right away, you know, you can do an okay job or you can do a phenomenal job. And there's a sense of beauty in a bed that's wonderfully made, in a bathroom that's super clean. But I asked her, I said, you do this. I mean, you've cleaned thousands of times. You've cleaned a bathroom out here and you're still doing great work. Why, why, did, why do you do it? She said, oh, it's easy. I said, well, what? She said, I think two things. First of all, I think about what the person who's going to be in this room is going to experience. And the second is I think, oh, I'm cleaning this bathroom for God. And, and so whether you're running a, a really a large business and can make certain kinds of decisions or whether you're in a, you know, it, it, a very small piece of a larger thing, we can learn to see our work a, a, a differently. But here again, uh, it, it may well be that these folks sort of did it on their own because they're particularly insightful, but most of us need brothers and sisters in Christ. We need the church to be the place where we work on this sort of thing, where we can come to say, look, you know, my job is uh, I, I'm an attorney and I defend bad people. So how is that going to honor God? Well, that's the kind of stuff we need to work on together in community, not just to look for the pastor. But again, the pastor is helping to shape the people and shape the community so that these things can be worked through. You know, Mark, um, what I love about the story about that janitor, that person that made beds and clean bathrooms, is it wasn't some high-minded theological treatise and study of this Hebrew root that talks about, you know, it was, it basically was a summary of, of Jesus' words, love, love God and love neighbor, right? I want the person that's coming into here to experience a place of cleanliness and beauty. That's love of neighbor. 
I'm doing this job to please God. Oh, that's love of God. That's like, the, that's the great commandment uh, embodied in a woman that, um, you know, in, in one way had thought very deeply about this. She was very intentional about that. And sometimes I think we think this has to be so complicated, but that's really simple. And that is bringing meaning to, to her work. Um, now, there are probably ways where, where bosses and managers can make that woman's work miserable or mm -hmm. delightful, but at least where she's at right now, um, she's, she's thinking in that way. So thank you for that, that example. Um, I want to go back uh, to this question about formation, uh, Denise. There was a follow-up that came from Katie. And uh, Katie says, say more about formation. How would you encourage those in the workplace to seek the connection to how Jesus is at work in the relational and practical pinch points of the workplace? Uh, so you've talked about the calendar, you've talked about email, but just say more about how God maybe uses the workplace to form us into Christ likeness and what, what comes to mind. Well, I, I mean, this is not gonna be a surprise, I don't think to anybody on this webinar, but the workplace is the place that most people are most of the time. And so it stands to reason that it's the place that God uses to, to form us. How does that happen? Um, I think there are lots of different ways. And again, I don't think it's formulaic, except insofar as to say the workplace is where we can be attentive to, to God. And so the more we are attentive to God, the more we are attentive to what God is doing in us, through us, around us, the more we become formed in Christ's likeness. Um, and sometimes that those are really practical things, things like making sure you're getting enough sleep so that you're not so crabby that you're, you know, irritable with people the next day. Um, so, so sometimes that formation is not so much high minded, you know, what's God doing here right now, but it's, it's much more, have I eaten recently? Have I gotten enough sleep? Am I, am I living my life in a way that's healthy so that I can actually engage and interact with people in a way that reflects what God would want me to be, to be doing? Um, we, we've talked about formation. We've talked a little bit about reframing the purpose of work. And I think all of those are really good and important. And I wrote a book on, on formation, so I, I don't want, want to discount that at all. But I also think we have, we've missed something in this conversation. We've, we've skipped over one other area that's really important for people and churches particularly to help people engage in terms of their work and how it's contributing to God's kingdom. And that is this, this area of justice. And so what does the workplace do that contributes to justice in our world? There's, there are issues of economic justice, there are issues of racial justice, there are, and, and oftentimes those intersect. Um, but what is the workplace doing to contribute to that? And I think having people step back a little bit and ask the question, is my work contributing to God's kingdom in this way, is a question of discernment that also needs to be something that can be raised in the context of the church community and that would be really helpful for people. And we did hear this in our, in our um, interviews. Um, so we did hear comments from people along the lines of, hey, we want more formation. We want our pastors to help us think through how to pray about our work. We want our pastors to help us um, think about discerning our, our particular vocations. Um, but they also were, were, and this was particularly true among our African-American and Hispanic respondents. They were much more likely to say things like, hey, we want our churches to be places where we could get help with resume writing. We want our churches to be places that um, are contributing to um, economic rejuvenation in the community. I mean, these are these are big asks, right? But, but they're also things that are really important if the church is going to be living out God's kingdom on this earth that we need to be attentive to. Yeah. So I don't want to lose of that. Yeah, such a great comment, Denise. In a world that is crying out for justice and so many of these issues are being brought to light in ways that as you say, many in the African-American community, they're like, hello, yes, obvious, this is what we've been facing, but many of our people are seeing it in a new light for maybe the first time or the seriousness of it. And what a rich resource that we as believers have that our God is a God of justice. And how does that come to bear in the workplace? Um, I, I love that you call attention but to that. I, I, and I think that's crucial. So yes, thank you. I have said, and it may be wrong, it may be an exaggeration, but I still think it, that for most Christians, their workplace is the primary place in the world where they can do, as Micah 6, 8 says, and do justice or do justly. That, you know, I mean, obviously our vote matters and, and whatever activism we do, and, and there are things we can do more broadly. 
but the truth is I'm not going to be able myself to deal with a lot of the big, big issues of justice that need to be dealt with. But I do have a measure of influence where I work in my staff, my office, my colleagues. And I, I think for most people to think about justice in terms of work, it, just on that level, what does it mean for me to treat my colleague? What does it mean if I have somebody who's not performing well? How do you, what does justice do when you actually have to lay somebody off as I've had to do recently because of the pandemic? What if somebody's not performing? What about systems and structures? And, and so I actually have quite a bit of freedom and authority in my relatively small place to, to ask what it is to do justice. If, if every Christian was asking that question about work, I think we would see some extraordinary things happen. And yes, some of it would be big. You know, I mentioned this car dealer and, and it, one of the things he did many years ago, he discovered basically that privileged people were much better at getting lower prices because they were good with bidding and, you know, that whole thing. Uh, people less privileged or less educated didn't do as well. And he says to him as a Christian, he says, you know, that's not just, that's not right. So he completely switched around the business to being one where there's just a set price and everybody gets the set price. And initially his board thought, what well, you're crazy, we're gonna go down. Well, they didn't, They're, they actually did well, but he may, so he had, that's a pretty big justice step. Most of us can't do that, but most of us do have some opportunity. And so it, it, Denise, it, it, there are big systemic things we gotta deal with in our country and in our world. And, and that's important. And then I know what you were saying, but we can also, we gotta think about where we can make a difference. Mm -hmm. I'm going to um, go to, that's really great, Mark. I want to go to this question from Peter. Um, we've been talking um, about a lot of issues, but another one that Peter brings up is, do you also feel Christians struggle with ambition in work? Is it right to ask for a raise or promotion or is that pride, greed, et cetera? Um, where does ambition fall in this? And most people want to do well in their work. They want to get that raise. They want to get that promotion. They want to have typically more influence, not, not in every case, but how do we think well about that as, as Christians in the workplace? I think Mark, you should handle this one. <laughs> <laughs> Jump oh, in Mark and, that's and such a call. great question. I, I would confess that that has been uh, one of my own struggles about work from the beginning, right? And, and because I'm to be a servant. It's not just that I've been a pastor. I mean, it's just I'm to be a servant of Christ and of others. And where does ambition fit? So I, I have, I have, a, I have a thought about that, which is that there are different kinds of ambition, right? If my ambition in life is to be famous and well thought of and have enough power to just boss people around, do what I want, you know, that's that's a bit of a problem. There, there can be an ambition to build a company that serves people well with good products and fair prices and that, that, that the employees are treated well. And, and so there are different kinds of ambition. I mean, I think of what um, uh, Jim Collins talks about a level five leader who is uh, someone who is at the same time profoundly humble and uh, deeply, to use this language, deeply ambitious for the work, for the company, not for himself or herself. So one can be ambitious without being selfishly or sinfully ambitious. And part of what that's always going to include is ambition for the kingdom of God. You know, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If I'm only ambitious for my own growth, my own opportunity, my own salary increase, whatever, and, and there's no kingdom piece of that, I'm missing something pretty important. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, there'd be much more to say. See, this would be an example, though. What I'd love to do if I had my pastor's study, and now I got 25 people in the workplace to say, okay, what do we do with ambition? Because there's stuff in the Bible about selfish ambition. What do we do with this? And I would love to have a half hour with some folks to just toss this around, because I guarantee you, I would learn a lot in that conversation. It's, you know, Mark, I, I love that. And as you were talking, it, it strikes me that there's at least one place in the Bible where it says to be ambitious. And one of the things that follows it is work. We, we remember that passage in, in Thessalonians, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your own hands. Like that should be part of our ambition is to, to do our work uh, heartily and as well as we possibly can 
uh, unto the Lord. So I love that um, uh, you address that. Uh, unfortunately, I, I've got a bunch of questions here and so many that are great. And I just want to keep talking with Denise and Mark because you're both so fantastic. But we need to come to an end uh, for this uh, webinar. We want to thank again our sponsor, Thrivent, for making this happen and uh, for sponsoring today's Common Practice webinar. So grateful for Thrivent and their work. Um, for, for all of you on the call, if you've never uh, gone to our website and asked to, to join our network, if you do that, we'll send you a box of resources for free, no catches. Uh, we want to resource you in any way that we can and, and come alongside. Thank you for joining uh, this webinar today. And we'll be back again with a Common Practice webinar. Stay tuned for details uh, on, our, on our website and on Facebook for, for the next one. I want to thank Denise and Mark for joining us. Uh, God bless you and may uh, God's peace and blessing and, and his power rest on you and your work uh, this day. Thanks for joining us.